Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending one of our programs um, in honor of One City, One Story 2022, presenting the book by Susan Strait in the country of women. We're pleased that you're here today. If you haven't had a chance um, or you didn't have a chance to attend the um, program, on Thursday, March the 10th with Susan Strait. You can still do so on YouTube Pasadena Library. Today's program will also be recorded. Thanks very much to Dr. Khan for allowing us to do that. And again, you can go to YouTube Pasadena Library. So in order to uh, have the most optimal viewing enjoyment for everyone, I have some things to tell you that you probably all know. So if you could please mute yourself. Also in chat, you can put your questions and Tracy will um, answer your questions after the program. So think of them as you're enjoying the program. Um, there's live recording, so you can enable that on your computer yourself. Okay. so. Um, Today you're here for Riverside Citrus Story. Citrus diversity was a key character driving the economic development and culture of Riverside and numerous other Southern California cities. The Gavadi and Citrus Variety Collection at the University of California, Riverside preserves and utilizes over 1000 cultures and species for research, teaching, and to extend knowledge on citrus diversity. This program highlights events that set the story time for why Riverside and University of California Riverside are still key drivers for advancing knowledge for the global citrus industry. Today's program is presented by Dr. Tracy Kahn, curator and Gavidian Citrus Valley Variety Collection Endowed Chair for the University of California, Riverside. And we are honored that she is here today to present for us. So welcome, Dr. Khan. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so share. We have to go back to the beginning. I don't know how that, wait. Oh. Okay, oops, okay. Somehow that has stopped the sharing screen. Tiffany, we might need help with this, okay. Uh, it is shop, oh my gosh, where did my screen go? I might have to go find it again. Yeah, if you could just restart your PowerPoint. Reset my PowerPoint, so take it out and put it back in. Yeah, do yeah, just reopen it, close it and open it. Okay. Open it. Close it. Open it. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. So So while we're waiting, I want to remind everyone if you haven't had an opportunity to read Susan's book, it's available at the Pasadena Public Library, as well as her other books. Her new book, Mecca, that has just come out is available as well. Okay, it says share. I think that will make it share. Oops, wrong share. Okay, okay. Here we go, sorry for the delay, it's always. No problem, these things happen. We've been practicing before, and then the more you practice, so we still have the black lines in there that we didn't have before. See if you could start the side slideshow Pardon? anyways. Go ahead and start from the beginning. Um, okay. I'm at the beginning, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Do you have the black lines? Yes. We didn't have those before. Um, 
Did you click on the sound? Thank you all for your patience. Did you click on the sound one? If you take off the sound, maybe that'll eliminate it. When you did the screen share. Click. Okay, did that make it going? Oh, there we go. Yes, click it again. One more. One more click. click again. Uh, now I just so I just X'd out that black line. I was able to do that, but I have to stop sharing and right because it's come back. Okay. okay. Stop sharing and okay. X out share. X out the sound. Okay. Okay, we're good? Yes, yes, we're good to go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so welcome. Here's my story called Riverside Citrus Story. Okay. Okay, I want to thank you. I'm really honored to participate as one of the events uh, selected for um, uh, selected for the 2022 Pasadena Public Library's One City One Story selection, which is uh, Susan Strait's book in the Country of Women. I loved reading this book. I hope you enjoyed it too. Uh, recently, I was really lucky. I was outside gardening. And uh, Susan and Dwayne were on one of their walks through the wood streets. I live in the wood streets of Riverside and I was gardening and I got to talk to them in a, about this series and um, how excited I was to participate. A large part of, uh, of Susan's amazing memoir is set in Riverside and Citrus is actually a key focal point in her descriptions of Riverside and in other parts of SoCal, such as Pasadena. Um, Citrus is um, also a key driver, um, as the introduction said, of the economic development and culture of Riverside, as well as numerous other Southern California cities, such as Orange County. That county actually got its name from due to the fact that there was many citrus trees at one time growing there. And Citrus is my focus today. Okay, so I have a caveat. I'm, I'm not a historian, but I am a citrus scientist and I'm actually the curator, as Christine mentioned, of what's called the Givadon Citrus Variety Collection at the University of California in Riverside. And since 1995, I've been really lucky to be um, both a researcher at this university and the guardian of this amazing collection, which is one of the world's most diverse collections, living collections of citrus and related uh, species. Um, my research actually uh, utilizes collection and it focuses on breeding and evaluation of new citrus cultivars for the California citrus industry. These are cultivars that you will see in the grocery store and farmers markets and some of them that are currently there, I evaluated a number of years ago. And like many Riversiders, I too am an immigrant to this area as is citrus. And I'll talk more about that. Citrus actually originated in Southeast Asia and during the Miocene. And um, it then has been moved around the world since then. Um, now citrus has grown about 35 North latitude to 35 <laughs> South latitory, latitude. And it was introduced into the Americas by Columbus on his second voyage in 1493. And it was spread, uh, then spread into North America. The first significantly sized grove in California was at the San Gabriel mission. And I know that Susan talked about um, the mission project that students all do in California. And this is one of those missions. It had um, a lot of citrus growing there and there were, um, gold rush settlers in the, around the 1840s. Uh, and there was an individual named William Wolfskill. And he actually um, took advantage of the fact that the gold rush was going on. And he began hit the first commercial orchard of citrus, which he planted in 1841 with seedlings that actually came from that mission. And um, that citrus became very um, marketable and desired by people that were in the state for the gold rush. 
His success actually inspired other ones, other people to grow citrus. And by the 1870s, growers began earning about $1,000 an acre from citrus, which was a tremendous amount of money at the time. You can see the San Gabriel mission up there and a picture, an old picture of his grove, as well as a picture or a drawing of W. Wolfskill. Um, so he also was involved in the shipping of the first train, um, train car load of citru um, citrus to the east in 1867. But citrus was also marketed throughout um, California and that statewide um, there were developed to be a demand for citrus and it generated what people often called the orange fever. So now in Riverside was a planned community, which I think you've already heard about. And there's search, there was a search of ways to generate more income. And that led, um, to Riverside's first orange trees being planted by this guy named K.D. Shugart, who is pictured up here on the right. And then years, uh, about a year later, a guy named D.C. Tugold established the first citrus nursery on Olivewood, which became a local resource for more citrus growers to buy trees and plant them and set up their own groves. And there were many new varieties that were introduced from all over the world, including things like the Mediterranean sweet, which you see at the bottom right hand corner, and paper rind and St. Michael's. And these were the early oranges that were here in Riverside. They were very seedy, as you see of that picture, but they were juicy and tasty. Um, so there were a number of Chinese laborers that were here in California that were experienced in growing citrus and they actually helped um, build the industry. And then uh, along the way, as I think you've heard in other series or other immigrants from other countries that also contributed greatly to the industry. And by 1882, um, bearing trees had increased to over half a million in the state and almost half of them growing in riverside orchards. Okay, um, so, but there were some other trees, these uh, what are called the parent Washington naval orange tree. And there were three trees that actually launched uh, the California's naval industry. And California is still known for the parent Washington naval and now other naval cultivars that are grown throughout California. And they were introduced, the parent Washington naval orange Orange was introduced by Eliza and Luther Tibbetts to Riverside in 1873. And it also provided a great uh, a stimulus to that early citrus industry because, um, so how they got it is that there was um, budwood, which is like a branch with buds at the axis in the axle of each leaf that um, was sent to uh, USDA in Washington um, to a guy named W. Sanders. And so these, um, these buds then were, these trees were grown from those buds and then they were tried out in different places in, in the United States. They tried them in Florida, they didn't work very well. And then they sent them to California to Eliza and Luther Tibbetts. And they found that the, the oranges that um, grew on these trees were superior in many ways. They were seedless, which was the first time people had seen that. They were deep orange and rind color, and they had this amazing juicy flavor. And this, um, this actually asked, acted as an increase that orange fever in Southern California and influenced all sorts of land patterns and water systems and economic development as it adapted to, um, to a to deal with this growing industry. And at the bottom, you can see a picture of, of Eliza on the left and actually Sanders on the right and then the original trees in the middle. And then there is an existing tree that still exists in Riverside and it's on the corner of Magnolia and Arlington. And it is one of those three trees. But one of the challenges to building an, an industry, um, oh, this is, 
is was the was the need to expand the market by shipping to the east. And I told you that W. Wosko was one of the first to ship. But by 1900, rain car, um, car, rail cars filled with oranges and lemons um, that were, they were trying to send to the east actually um, had lots of decay. The oranges had lots of decay. So they tried to figure out how to solve that problem. The industry was actually claiming they were losing a million dollars a year. And to try to solve this problem, they brought in a guy named uh, Harold G. Powell. And you see him pictured when he was younger and then older. And he, um, he came from USDA in Washington and he launched a revolution in Riverside in how you handle fresh produce. So you see at the right, there's a picture of these clippers and he actually developed these clippers that were round and had no sharp edges so that when people went in to harvest the oranges that they wouldn't actually poke holes in them, which would open opportunities for fungal spores to get in. So his, he changed all the techniques, not only in how you harvested, but how you shipped um, the oranges and lemons across the country that actually um, solved the issue and um, changed the industry. Harold G. Paul late, later became the general manager of Fruit Growers Exchange, which was later um, changed name to become Sunkist in 1912. There's an amazing book called um, uh, Letters from the Orange Empire, which are letters that Harold G. Powell wrote to his wife. And most of them he uh, written from the Glenwood Mission Inn, which is now called the Riverside Mission Inn. So um, there were growers had other issues beyond shipping of, of fruit across the nation. They had, and they were looking for answers to a lot of their uh, issues with growing citrus and dealing with diseases. And um, so what happened is the USDA and the first Morrill Land Grant Act in 1862 initiated the era of public education. And UC became a land grant institution in 1868 and still is. And then there was the Hatch Act that provided uh, annual money to each land grant college to promote agricultural science in US. And this um, Riverside community actually lobbied for a citrus experiment station. And the first site was on the side of Mount Rubidoux, which is the mountain near the uh, center of Riverside that has a cross on it. And they uh, established the experiment station there in 1907, but, um, and they had a small grove and they had this house there, but then there was a killer freeze in 1913 and they realized that it wasn't an ideal um, location. So they had, um, there was a call for by UC to generate a new site that would have, would not have these frost issues and that would have more land and many, many communities actually competed and Riverside was successful and won again in 1914. And there was, you know, announcements in the papers and they rang bells at local churches and it was a very big deal for the community. So you can see the original location here on the picture on the top and then the new location that was dedicated in March 27, 1918. I love this picture of this woman sitting on the tractor with the, with the buildings in the background. And those buildings are still there on the UCR campus. So the original uh, staff of the Citrus Experiment Station um, became leaders in their fields. They tackled a whole range of problems from like disease issues to pests that affected citrus to improving cultural practices, to developing agriculture machinery, um, to creating new varieties um, and important basic science. And what I know most about is about the new varieties and some of the basic science, science that was done. Weber established, and he was the first director of the experiment station. He's the one that's looking up at the tree with his hand on the tree. And he established a small grove of citrus trees in 1910, which became the collection that I am now the curator of, or the citrus variety collection. 
Um, and there was a breeder. The first breeder is Howard Frost, and you can see him looking into the microscope where he established the chromosome number for citrus with that microscope. Um, okay, so if you fast forward through many, many years of uh, successful research at the Citrus Experiment Station, in 1954, this uh, location um, became a undergraduate college, Letters and Sciences, and, um, and UC Riverside. So there's a picture of our bell tower at the base there. And the thing is that citrus is still very important today at UCR. There are many researchers still doing research on citrus and we use research and we use citrus to teach about both citrus and teach about plants. Um, I bring people into the collection all the time. And this historic um, treasure includes uh, cultivars or varieties and, um, that were introduced into California in the early 1900s to ones that are the latest um, varieties that we are actually have developed as part of our breeding program. The collection that you see a picture of with the mountains in the background has uh, two trees of a thousand, little bit more than a thousand different um, cultivars and species. Um, um, some of them of, of citrus relatives. And we have a backup collection in the screen greenhouse. And if you, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna give you a virtual tour, but you'll see that there are, are cultivars that have fruit as small as a green pea and one as big as a person's head. And the scents and the flavors um, are, tr have tremendous diversity. Um, citrus is blooming in Riverside right now and it, it smells wonderful in the collection. The collection is also a resource for preservation and of citrus biodiversity, but also, as I said, of research and education. So one thing I'm gonna diverge just shortly to tell you a little bit about what uh, we think shifting views of what um, actually constitutes different species. We use terms like oranges, lemons, limes, grapefruits based on a test a swingle system of taxonomy that was established uh, many years ago. But since the 1980s, we've shifted our understanding of the number of basic biological species. And so uh, many of the cultivated um, cit citrus, um, cultivated citrus cultivars or varieties are actually hybrids of five or maybe more. There's still debate about this wild progenitor species. So. The original ones were one was a pumelo, um, one was a mandarin, but it's not the mandarins you know. It was something very small, very seedy, and not particularly sweet. One was a kumquat, one was a citron, which you see pictured here, and one was one you'd probably never seen in person before called a small flowered pepita or citrus macanthra. And what we know now is that um, sweet oranges, and that includes the navels and blenches and blood oranges, are actually hybrids between a pomelo and a mandarin. And um, many of the mandarins that we actually consume now have small amounts of pomelo genes in them as well. And then there were small genetic changes as among the sweet oranges that made them different, like gave them red coloration to make them blood oranges. But also the pomelo cross with the mandarin generated sour oranges, like the ones that are used to make marmalade or um, bergamot, which is used to make Earl Grey tea flavoring. And then citron crossed with that small flowered pepita. So something big and something very small generated the small fruited lime that you know as the Mexican lime or key lime that has seeds in it. And then there were a second generation of hybrids. So those sweet oranges that are in themselves a hybrid crossed with a pomelo generated grapefruit. We know this happened in the Barbados in the 1700s and the original ones were um, very, were white and sour oranges crossed with citrons actually generated lemons. Uh, so none of the, I'm gonna give you this virtual tour and none of the things I'm gonna show you are native to the US, which is why I said citrus itself was an immigrant. 
all were either imported from around the world or they're products of local selections or products of our breeding program. And these, this collection is used by researchers, including the Citrus Breeding Program, which has developed over 50 different uh, cultivars that are now grown around the world since the 1920s. Um, and then we actually also have the USDA National Clonal Germplasm Repository for Citrus and Dates located adjacent to the collection because they partner with us um, to protect this collection and they also utilize it for research. So this is used by, collection is used by um, researchers and other universities in the United States, as well as companies. I'm showing you a picture on the right of the developers on the top of something called the Tango, which you may have eaten as either cuties and halos. Those are trademark names, um, not cultivar names. And Tango is one of the uh, cultivars that goes into those boxes and bags. So here we go, we're gonna go on our virtual tour. I'm gonna to show you pictures uh, to show you some of the diversity. Um, we have the Washington Naval here in the middle and um, the Washington Naval right now is under a screen structure to protect it from a citrus disease, the possibility of an insect moving the bacteria that causes citrus screening disease. So this tree was the one that was planted in 1873, but then there's a new navel that was just made available to um, nurseries and growers to propagate um, about six months ago called Shahani red navel, which was a small genetic change from a navel orange. And it's a, has blood coloration and it has, um, if you cut it the other way, it looks sort of like a sunrise. And then many of you may know Cara Cara, which is a pink navel, which has a different pigment than the blood oranges. It has the pigment that you would find in great pink grapefruit, which is called lycopene. Then there's many mandarins. And as I was telling you, most of these mandarins actually have small amounts of, of pomelo genes in them, which gives them their size. Um, and we have them from that have come to this collection from all over the world, such as Amoa 8, which is a blood mandarin that came to us from Sicily, and Citrus Tachibana, which came to us is an, um, from Japan, is actually an, an ancient Chinese variety. And then Gold Nugget, in addition to Tango, were both developed at UCR, and both are seedless mandarins that are quite tasty. Then here's some sour oranges, including Seville that's been, was traditionally used to make marmalade and then Chinoto, which is a very ornamental uh, sour orange that's actually grown as an ornamental and used to decorate cities quite often. A lot of them are used in Italy. And then Boque de Fleur is actually one that's used to make oil of neroli, which is an oil used for um, from the flowers for perfumes. And then bergamot I mentioned is the sour orange that is the flavoring of Earl Grey tea. Grapefruits uh, are on top. And as you know, there are pink grapefruits like star ruby, which has the highest pink coloration of all grapefruits. Then some with lighter ones like red butt blush and then Duncan, which was the first grapefruit that came into the United States, um, into Florida. And it is uh, a white seedy grapefruit. But as you now know, grapefruits are actually a hybrid between an orange and a pomelo. And below we have Cowpen, which is a true pomelo, and Chandler, which are true pomelos. And pomelos can have pink coloration or green or, or or white, as you see here. And then in the middle, I have a picture of a hybrid that was developed at UCR that is a hybrid between a blood orange, a pomelo, and a mandarin. And if you use your imagination, it looks sort of like a heart and it matures at Valentine's Day. Then we have citrons um, that are used traditionally to make candied citron for fruitcake and other confectionaries. Buddha's hand, which is also a citron, 
but has no flesh. Lemons such as uh, um, such as the variegated pink eureka and Allen variegated are more unusual than the ones that you normally see in the grocery store. And then Meyer is actually an orange lemon hybrid that's a little bit sweeter and looks a little bit more like an orange. Then there are limes. There are the small fruited ones, like I mentioned, which is the Mexican and the Castilla. <laughs> And then a uh, different hybrid, which is called the Tahitian lime or the Bear's lime. And those are always seedless, whereas the small fruited limes are always seedy. And there's even more diversity, which is very, very cool. And so I thought I'd show you a picture of some other ones that we have in the collection that are fairly amazing looking. And we have citrus relatives too, including the thing on the far left-hand side in the middle that has little tiny juice vesicles coming out. That's called Australian finger lime. It's sort of like the pop rocks of citrus and, and it tastes a little bit like lime and it pops in your mouth. And then that shaggy one near the bottom on, not right on the right side that looks, that's actually called Aroma Citrus Glauca and it's very drought tolerant and very resistant to this, that new citrus disease, citrus screening disease. Um, so as I mentioned, this uh, collection is used by researchers, but it's also used for classes, um, for an annual experiment in Chemistry 125, and by CDFA and USDA APHIS regulators to learn about citrus, also by many other visitors who come through the collection. But we attracted um, interest from, from companies and we have hosted a numerous ones over the years. Some came once, some came multiple times. But after their visit by, the visit by Jivanon in 2006, a relationship um, developed. And I wanna tell you a little bit about that. Let's see. Okay, so Citrus, uh, Jivanon is a really interesting company uh, and people don't know very much about the kind of company that Jivanon is. It's a fragrance and flavor company. So they make the, um, I've worked mostly with the flavor group and they make the flavors for most of the beverages and food flavors that we have too. They provide consistency for products that we sell that get sold in stores. And citrus is one of the world's favorite beverage flavors. The obvious is orange flavored drinks and lemon and lime, but not so obvious is colas. Cola is actually a lime beverage. Um, it's got cinnamon in it and other flavors as well. But um, Coca-Cola and colas of all types are actually based on lime. And then teas and fruit punch is also a citrus beverage as well. And what Juvenon does is they make the building blocks for citrus flavors but, um, from the byproduct of the juicing and processing. So when oranges get uh, juiced in Brazil and in Florida, they produce oils um, like peel oils and essence oils and water phased aromas that then get um, processed and used to make flavors. And when they came here and to Riverside in 2006, they came here because they were trying to inspire the next generation of authentic flavor experiences um, because they had realized that they were tending to make the same orange flavors over and over again. And so the collection gave them a chance to think about flavors differently. Okay. Doesn't seem like it gives. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If Tiffany, if you could show the video. Okay. Okay, this is takes place inside the, they film this in the collection, let's see. The Jivanon Citrus Variety Collection is a collection of fruits located at the University of California, Riverside, which contains over a thousand different varieties of citrus and related species. We 
want to share that with our customers in a greater sense. There's one grove, lots of different customers, and we can't, we can't get everyone there and give them that experience, but this brings the experience to our customers. By putting the VR goggles on, you will be transported to the citrus groves where our experts will guide you through the UCR citrus variety collection. So Juvadan, there is a very strong culture of innovation. The vast technology allows flavorists to create in real time flavor compositions in front of the customers or even perhaps the consumer. And they can hear the sounds that happen in the grove. They can smell the fruit, the variety, the different flavors. They're wrapped around their eyes. You just have to navigate through the 15, 360 stereoscopic videos. We're, we're talking about citrus profiles that are beyond your imagination. We believe that digital is a fundamental aspect of the innovation for the future. This is a mandarin I want to show you. Cutting entirely the chain of product development that enables us to create products much faster. Virtual Taster Citrus is also about sparking inspiration. It allows us to look at what's next. Essentially to provide all the knowledge at the push of the button. Available at your fingertips. And then it allows them to take those and recreate those flavors tuned exactly to what they need for the products they're developing. We are essentially bringing Citrus Tech to everybody in the world without travel. It's going to be a great tool for our customers. Hello, Tiffany. So, okay, and I'll go back to sharing my screen. So they made this video for their customers, but I thought it was kind of fun to see the, the piece that they shared um, because it really does show a little bit of how they're using these flavors, um, using the collection to inspire new flavors. Okay, it doesn't seem to be going. Oh, here we go. So they, and they have developed uh, numerous new flavors with uh, major beverage companies, all the different companies you can imagine, um, big companies across the world over the years since 2006. And slowly we developed a partnership and they, they come numerous times a year. This year they only came four times because of this is the first time they've been able to come in two years since the pandemic. And they've also done many other things. They give presentations and classes. They co-hosted a mixology event for mixed drinks for the Chancellor's Associates Group. And they um, have hired undergraduates to actually uh, do research with Jibadon scientists um, just before the pandemic. And that research actually ended up in uh, a publication that just came out. Uh, so in 2017, um, the, the disease, Wang Lung Bing or citrus greening dis, um, disease was actually discovered in Riverside about 2.25 miles from, the, from UCR. And that crystallized a need that we couldn't just have a field collection. We needed um, further protection for this, um, for this collection or we'll still have the field collection, but we're going to have this other um, protected collection that's covered with screen that will have one of most of the, the trees in it. Um, and what Jivanon did is they gave us a significant amount of money in 2019 to make this, what is called a cup structure, citrus under protective screen possible. And it's almost done and you can see a, a stage of it up above. It now is a little bit farther along um, and we're going to start screening it in the next couple of weeks. I also wanted to, before I ended, I wanted to give you some idea that citrus research continues to thrive at UCR. So I was gonna show you um, some examples of people, um, Mike Bruce and uh, Tim Williams, who's not pictured here, were the ones that developed um, both Tango Mandarin and Gold Nugget Mandarins. 
um, and he is a geneticist and citrus breeder. Chandrika Ramadugu is actually doing uh, a lot of research that's fighting uh, this uh, citrus greening disease by breeding citrus that will be tolerant or resistant to this disease. And then Hailing Jin, uh, all three of these individuals are directly using the collection. But Hailing Jin is a um, is actually doing research to and uh, where she's identified a stable antimicrobial peptide from a citrus in the collection called Australian finger lime. And what this um, peptide or small protein does is it destroys as the bacteria. Um, that causes HLB, and it can actually help prevent um, the disease from, from developing, from infection occurring by the bacteria. And then here's two other uh, citrus researchers who are very active um, nowadays. One is Georgios Vitalakis, who is the um, director of the Citrus Clonal Protection Program, which is the gatekeeper for bringing in new varieties into the country and into the state. He, his program tests them for about 12 different uh, citrus diseases and pathogens. And if they're, once they, and they clean them up if it's necessary. And once they are clean, they release the budwood, which becomes registered budwood that then nurserymen can actually propagate new trees from that are free of these diseases. And then Carolyn Roper is doing some really interesting work on the citrus microbiome as a way of uh, focusing on how the bacteria interacts with the tree and interacts with the insect that carries that bacteria to try to work around it to evade this, um, this disease triangle um, that produces the citrus greening disease. And the last thing I wanted to do was to say that, yes, citrus is still a key character in Riverside and California. Places you can visit in Riverside. One is the Citrus State Historic Park. And um, you can just um, look, up at the, look up the park. It's open on the weekends and most days. And it has a citrus grove there, but it also has a small museum as well as some interactive exhibits out in the field that you can visit. And then there is a magazine called the Riversider and it's actually available online as well. This is the newest issue that's not online, but it has an um, by Vincent Moses, who has taught many of us about uh, citrus history. And this article talks about, um, focuses on this billion dollar naval the Washington Naval and its and the rise of the citrus, uh, Riverside Citrus Empire, and how, um, why, and how um, the California Citrus State Historic Park was established. And finally, we have this museum uh, called the Riverside Museum, uh, which is pictured on the right. It's currently being uh, um, updated, so that part of the museum isn't open, but there is a portion of the museum called Heritage House, which was a house that existed during uh, the heyday of the early citrus industry called uh, Heritage House, and it's on Vic Magnolia Avenue. And so, yes. And with that, I'm going to end and answer any questions you have. I've given you our website. If you just put citrus variety collection into Google, you can find our website and look at varieties. You can see a listing of all the thousand different varieties in the collection. And we have an Instagram site to hashtag citrus variety collection. Okay, Thanks. and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for such a fabulously interesting program. I don't think all of us knew how many different varieties of citrus there were and how they actually were cultivated, how um, you got to some of the new varieties that we can get in the market very easily and how they came about. Um, it's fabulous. Um, 
So one of the questions is if you were starting a citrus grove back in the 1880s, how long from the time you planted your trees would they bear fruit that you could sell? Or that would apply to today too. Well, it's a little different today. Um, back initially when they were starting groves, they started everything from seeds initially. And uh, at least in the very beginning or for some trees, they planted them as seedlings. And so citrus trees, like many other uh, tree crops have what are called a juvenility period. So there's a period of time from maybe five to up to like 19 years before they start to flower and then fruit. So it could take a very long time if you were starting it from seed. But what we do nowadays, all commercial growths are, are based on um, grafted trees where you start with a seedling rootstock that is true to type, to the type you started with. And you um, take a bud from a branch about pencil thick branch, which is an axle of every leaf. And you cut it out and you make what we do is tea budding, but there are other kinds. And you make a tea cut into the bark about a foot from the ground. And you insert that bud and you bend over the top of the rootstock tree and that allows the, um, that bud to push and become the new top of the tree. So if you look at, if any of you have commercial, uh, have citrus trees, all trees that even you buy for your backyard, you can see there's a line about a foot from the ground or around the trunk and everything below that line is the rootstock and everything above it is, this, is the cyan or the type we eat. And the thing is, is that that does one, it speeds up the process because you're starting from something, a bud that's older. And so it would take only now four years till you would start to have fruit, four to five years. Um, but it does other things because the rootstock actually helps protect the tree and make it uh, less susceptible to a number of citrus diseases. Okay, is it possible to buy some of the um, old varieties? Can you yes. still- yeah, some of them are still available. Um, yes, there's some of them that are available from, so when you go to like um, a nursery, a common nursery, they're, um, they're buying from wholesale nurseries, um, but there are some citrus retail nurseries that exist, a few of them. One is called Four, F-O-U-R, Winds Growers. And they some of the varieties they have are actually very old older varieties. Um, there's also a possibility if you wanted to learn how to, to uh, propagate your own trees from and grow your own rootstock that you could purchase budwood from that program that Georgios Villacus has called the Citrus Clonal Protection Program. So if you put ccpp.ucr on um, no, at ucr.edu, ccpp at ucr.edu into Google, you'll find that program. And they, you can buy budwood from them. Okay, so someone is saying that Caltech has, a, Caltech has an ornamental citrus grove on campus. Do you happen to know what variety they are? Or actually we probably have to call Caltech. Yeah, I don't, I don't even visited Caltech. I visited the one at Cal Poly but not the one at Caltech. Um, so I don't know what they have there. So are your collections organically farmed? Is there any relationship with organic certification great agencies in your development of new cultivars? When you're talking about organic, it's, it's how you're growing things. It's not the actual material itself. All material you know, would be you would purchase the same varieties and it would be how you would grow them under um, certain conditions to allow them to be certified organic. Um, we um, actually use some pesticides in the citrus variety collection, especially now that the, the insect that carries the bacteria that causes citrus greening is actually sort of ubiquitous throughout Southern California. So uh, not all of the, of the Asian citrus psyllid that move that bacteria have the bacteria, but to make sure that um, they couldn't be um, 
introducing that bacteria into our trees. We do spray to reduce the population of the Asian citrus psyllids. Um, so we do do that and we use a couple other things. But you know, anybody that uses pesticides now um, doesn't use a lot of pesticides be because it's expensive to use pesticides and they use them fairly um, under really stringent regulations um, in terms of um, preventing exposure to people. So it's, it's not, it's, you know, I think that says most of that. I think I, I think that answered that, yeah. So do you have a favorite? Um, do I have a favorite? <laughs> Favorite out, out of all of these, how oh, it's gonna be so hard. So, yeah, it would be hard. So what I used to say, and it's really true, is that I have what I call sequential favorites. So I had some early favorites when I started being curator in 1996. Um, and then I kept those, and those are still my favorites. Things like seedless kishu and gold nugget and but then I, as I, as new ones got introduced or I discovered new ones, I added on to my favorites list. So now I have many favorites. Um, one of my newest ones I showed you today, which was the Shahani Red Navel. It's not only very, very pretty, but it, it tastes really good. It's really very tasty, um, but yeah, lots of favorites. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure it's very difficult <laughs> to just pick one or recommend one. So um, someone's asking that you said that the Washington navels were initially brought from Brazil. Could you tell us a little bit how that process was and um, how were the first Baja budwoods brought to the country? Uh, okay, so there's there's still some controversy over that um, because uh, some people say those were the very first navels, the one navel oranges, the ones that came from Bahia, Brazil. But um, there are some pictures time period that have shown oranges that had navel structures. The reason we call them generally navel oranges is they have a number of characteristics, but one of the pronounced one is that they have a structure on the blossom end, the one that's the opposite end to where they were attached to the, to the tree. And that, that if you cut them through that blossom end, you'll see there's a little fruit inside the larger fruit, and that's the navel structure. Um, so in Bahia, they, they, the USDA sent a number of uh, researchers down there back in, like I think about the, like the 1860s, and they found the Bahia uh, navels and, they, and the one that later got called Washington Naval, and they shipped some selections of Bahia to um, Washington, D.C., and then they propagated them and um, then they provided them to different growing regions. So what they did is they shipped up the budwood and then grafted them in Washington, D.C., and then renamed them Washington Navels and then provided trees of these to um, three trees to Eliza and Luther Tibbetts and other trees to different parts of the United States, such as Texas and so forth. Thank you. So somebody's asking about, they, or they're sorry that they missed the first 15 minutes due to technical problems, but they wanted to know, did you show or discuss citrus labels? Um, well, the program today is going to be recorded on YouTube Pasadena Library. And if you want to see a discussion about citrus labels and what they were, then please go to yesterday's presentation that will soon be on YouTube Pasadena Library called Pictorial Presentations of California Citrus Crate Labels. So those um, two different programs. Right, I didn't talk about uh, citrus labels at all, um, but yes, there, because there was another program on that. So what are the best ways or methods okay. to care for mature citrus? So I think there's... Uh, uh, what are the best ways method to care for mature uh, citrus trees? Um, of course, that's a giant question, and I actually know Brandon <laughs> can see his picture there, um, which we could have a long, long discussion on. 
But the most important things that uh, one has to be careful about uh, long, uh, older trees as well as young trees is that they are irrigated properly. Um, what one would think that, you know, underwatering them would be worse, but in fact, it's much worse if you are over, you provide too much water through your irrigation system, because what happens is the oxygen um, around in the soil um, gets pushed out and the roots um, are, don't have access to as much oxygen and that opens up opportunities for diseases like fungal diseases to take hold. So irrigation is probably a crucial thing for someone who's taking care of mature trees to be very careful about. Um, the other big thing, and there are a number of citrus uh, diseases um, and there's lots of information on them, but the, there's only a few that are really sort of deadly for citrus trees. Some of them are just produced, um, they produce, they cause leaves to curl or they um, can make the fruit have, you know, some minor damage, but it doesn't actually affect the ultimate ability to get a fruit crop. Um, but citrus greening disease, the one I've been talking about, which is also called long, long being, is a deadly, Um, causes that disease is now in Southern California and it's transferred by an Asian citrus psyllid. So in that case, it's very important that you control the uh, population of Asian citrus psyllids around your mature trees, but even more importantly for young trees so that they can get established. Um, but that's the disease I would be most worried about if I had mature trees. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for this fabulously interesting program. We all learned so much when we go to the market to pick out um, any of the citrus, we'll be looking at it in a different way. And then if we go to a nursery to select what we want, or we get a little bit more deeply involved, um, and then we should go out to Riverside to that citrus um, grove. Um, what was that called again? Riverside? The Citrus, River Citrus State Historic Park. It's one of the state um, parks system. It's one of the history state parks. And it's on, Van, it's on Van Buren. It's on Dufferin, but off of Van Buren. So thank you so much for a fabulously interesting. You're welcome. We appreciated your time and your um, knowledge to share with us. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you for letting me be part of. Yeah, thank you for letting me be part of this great program. Thank you. Bye thank bye. you again. Thank you. Bye bye.